Good morning. Thanks to everyone for being here today. And for those of you who are joining us virtually and from home, thank you so much to, for you for joining us as well. I'm Becca Wasser. I am a senior fellow in the defense program as well as lead of the gaming lab here at the Center for a New American Security. And today I am joined by uh, Dr. Celeste Wallander, who is the Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs. And we're going to have a pretty wide ranging discussion since your portfolio is quite large. Um, but this conversation today is part of the CNAS Mission Brief series, which is an event series where we're going to be talking about defense strategy and operations. And really what we're trying to do is have conversations with senior civilian and military leaders about some of the steps that we are doing and taking today to strengthen our ability to manage the future challenges of tomorrow. And that's why each event in the series has a specific topic, which is the mission brief, if you will. And we're going to dive into that today. But before we get started, I just have a few admin notes for everyone, uh, particularly our virtual viewers. So each discussion is recorded. It's on the record. This is a public event. Um, and we're also going to be posting the video after uh, the event for those who uh, might not be able to catch us in real time. Um, and we're going to start the, the uh, discussion with, you know, talking about what the mission brief is before the two of us are going to have a conversation. And then we're going to open it up to all of you for question and answers. So we're going to get some questions from our live in-person audience, as well as our virtual audience. For those who are joining us virtually, uh, you can ask questions by scrolling down to the Q&A toolbar at the bottom of your page. Uh, you know, please identify yourself so you know that your question is the one being asked. Um, alternatively, you can also use hashtag CNAS2023 to ask a question on Twitter. So without further ado, let's get started with the question of the day. Dr. Wallander, what is today's mission brief? Well, thank you for including me. I look forward to uh, having a conversation. Today's mission brief is on how the United States is working with allies and partners globally to advance the main elements of our national defense and national security strategies. And that primarily means coping with the pacing challenge of, of China, the acute threat of Russia, regional challenges such as those posed by Iran, and the ongoing challenge we face uh, with violent extremist organizations uh, across the globe. Okay, so I think that's a great segue to starting off our discussion with looking at the national defense strategy and sort of how you're supposed to be working with allies and partners within that. So if we are looking at the NDS, it cites allies and partners as the center of gravity of the strategy. And it notes that it's really going to be working with allies and partners uh, under this rubric of integrated deterrence. And integrated deterrence is defined a bit broadly, right? If I'm paraphrasing, it's working with allies and partners, but it's looking at you know, how it is you can use different tools in the broader interagency toolbox. It's looking at how you can work across geographies and across the spectrum of conflict. Um, so there's a bit of confusion, uh, particularly among some allies and partners, of what integrated deterrence means and what it means practically for them. And I recently wrote a report with my colleague Stacy Pettyjohn that was trying to delve into this issue of what is integrated deterrence with allies and partners and how is it that we do that. But I think there's still a lot of questions. So could you maybe talk a little bit more about how the department is thinking about uh, integrated deterrence with allies and partners and how it intends to work with them under the rubric of this concept? Sure, that's a, a great question. Um, integrated deterrence uh, is about using all of the instruments of national power to shape the security environment in order to protect and advance American national security interests and to create that level of credible deterrence so that adversaries of various uh, shapes and sizes um, are not tempted to try to exploit uh, the United States uh, and to uh, erode our national security interests. And so what the, the starting concept is, is that there's not any one instrument of the national, uh, of national capabilities that, can, uh, be, that needs to be turned to and overly relied upon. 
that effective deterrence will rely upon and draw upon all the tools of national power. And that helps you understand the concept of working with allies and partners, because all nations bring different strengths and capabilities to their own national defense strategies and, and policies. And by working with allies and partners, the United States is able to uh, rely upon those partners that may have the value of geographical position, may have particular uh, capabilities in their military uh, toolbox, or may have certain strengths in their economies, such as being able to work with the United States to cut off the flow of advanced technology to adversaries in order to be able to address concerns about their capabilities. So it's ex it, working with allies and partners is actually a force multiplier on the effectiveness of the United States to be able to shape what kinds of instruments we use to cope with a pacing challenge of a rising China or um, the acute uh, threat of Russia. I'll give you one quick example. We could not be as effective in our sanctions policy in imposing costs on Russia or in our export restrictions on Russian uh, defense industries if we didn't work with not only NATO allies, but actually G7 partners and more broadly partners across the globe. Because we have an integrated international economy, the United States acting alone would not be nearly as effective in imposing costly sanctions because Russia could get around them, or in constraining those defense technologies because of the broad scope of international trade. That's really interesting, and I want to pick up on one thing that you said. You talked about having credible deterrence. And for me, as you know, a military analyst, I really think about combat credibility and how that can enhance deterrence efforts. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about deterrence by denial. You know, the national defense strategy talks about three different types of deterrence. Uh, deterrence by collective cost imposition, deterrence by resiliency, but I'm going to focus on deterrence by denial because in some respects that really is the gold standard of deterrence. And so you know, thinking a little bit about that, how is the department expecting allies and partners to contribute to deterrence by denial against some of these priority threats? You know, you mentioned the acute threat of Russia, which falls under your portfolio, but we also have, as you said, the rising challenge of the, uh, the pacing challenge of China. So how is it that we're looking for allies and partners to contribute to deterrence by denial efforts? Well, the the bedrock of uh, American, of, of an example of, of relying upon allies and partners uh, to contribute to deterrence by denial is, of course, the NATO alliance. And the capabilities that each ally brings to the larger than the sum of its parts credible combat power that NATO can mount and make clear to a potential adversary, most specifically Russia, but any adversary. So the ability of NATO, for example, to not only uh, source uh, the, bat the eight battle groups that uh, now are um, stood up in the eight eastern flank countries, but also the capabilities required for uh, air policing that NATO allies contribute as well to manage the air domain or the coordination that NATO allies bring with their different naval capabilities and maritime uh, domain awareness capabilities to the Baltic Sea, to the Mediterranean, to the North Atlantic. So it is that broad scope of uh, credible combat power that comes from combined, for combined arms forces, uh, the jointness of our militaries, and that which ally brings something different to bear. And you can go through the same uh, examples for America's Asia-Pacific allies and partners and look at the different capabilities they bring to add to that larger picture of combat credibility. So, you know, there's a lot that's been ongoing in recent days about how we've been working with allies and partners, and I think, as you say, you know, what we've been doing with NATO in particular has been, you know, parallel. Um, we've also had a lot of efforts in the Indo-Pacific, and we're really just starting to double down on I, really working with these full force multipliers, as you said. But there still are a number of barriers to cooperation with allies and partners. The National Defense Strategy uh, gives a shout out to a few of these, but you know, there's some that just keep on coming up over and over again. You know, recently we've talked about some, uh, you know, some challenges to information sharing. 
that seems to be something that we can uh, you know, overcome during crises, but sometimes struggle with when we're looking at you know, forced planning efforts, for example, during you know, peacetime. Uh, there's also been a lot lately about you know, some of the export controls and how that stymied innovation and you know, uh, ways in which the United States could enter into you know, co-production of critical capabilities with allies and partners. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about some of the department's efforts to overcome these barriers so we can actually enhance our cooperation with allies and partners around the globe. You know, it's a really important question, and there, there's no one set of answers, but let me give you a few examples. Um, we are um, focused on making sure that the United States does not overclassify. It's important to classify at the appropriate level to protect sources and methods, to pr pr protect sensitive information. Um, but uh, the process of then sometimes downgrading exactly classified information that needs to be shared within the NATO alliance or with key allies and partners can slow down the cooperation. So there is a, a very strong focus right now on making sure that the workforce understands uh, the, uh, the processes, the rules, the standards for classification to maintain the correct standards, but not uh, unduly create problems for ourselves in that kind of information sharing. So that's piece one. Piece number two that's become very clear during the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine is that we need to spend more time looking at the defense industrial base, not just nationally, but um, the defense industrial bases of our allies and partners to create opportunities for whether it's co-production, whether it's joint procurement, uh, work proactively working with industry in order to identify the opportunity for larger production runs in order to supply not just individual countries that may come with contracts and, and requirements, but common uh, requirements across not just the NATO alliance, but globally. And that lesson learned is being applied not just right now in uh, Europe through the National Armaments Directors construct of the NATO alliance, but also those lessons learned are being used to look at uh, the, the Asia Pacific and to talk to allies and partners in Asia as well. So that I think is um, an example of where we experientially learned that there were some constraints on the ability of defense industry to produce and to produce quickly, some structural, some a result of the COVID crisis, uh, COVID epidemic. But uh, the good news is we've learned that when we put the focus on solving some of these roadblocks, we really can uh, make advancements, and we really have in the last year, Laura. That's great to hear. You know, the report that we recently published identified a number of these barriers, but also came down with this. Uh, frankly, what we really argue is that some, some of these feed into the fact that strategic and operational planning during peacetime has been lacking with allies and partners. And again, you know, we often see that during a crisis, such as in the run-up to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we can come together and we can overcome them. But it really does stymie some of our efforts to do that joint and combined planning. Mm -hmm. So it's great to hear that you're taking proactive steps mm -hmm. to try and overcome these wherever possible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just a reminder to our virtual audience to please keep your questions coming. I've already seen a bunch uh, coming in and they're great, but want to still have a bunch more. Reminder that this is your opportunity to try and shape a way that a senior leader is thinking about these challenges. So, you know, please keep coming. Um, and don't worry for our in-person audience, you're going to get a chance to ask questions too. So let's shift uh, to Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and specifically looking at the war in Ukraine. So, you know, Russia has been named the acute threat because of the near-term challenge that it poses not only in Ukraine, but in Europe more broadly. Um, but its military strength has been pretty significantly degraded because of some of its poor performance in that conflict. Um, what does the department see as the potential timeline for Russia to reconstitute its military strength? And what does that mean for how the DOD is thinking about efforts to strengthen deterrence in Europe with allies and partners, particularly along NATO's eastern flank as well as its southern flank? So absolutely. Uh, Russia's uh, 
conventional, especially ground capabilities, ground force capabilities in Europe have been significantly degraded. There's tens of thousands of casualties uh, Russia has suffered. Uh, it has probably lost half of its main battle tank uh, stock in, uh, in combat and through Ukrainian uh, capture. Uh, 80 percent, something like 80 percent of Russia's ground force capability is right now devoted to the fight in Ukraine, Russia's invasion in Ukraine. That said, uh, Russia retains a defense industrial base. Um, we have seen during the crisis it, it continues to produce at a lower level but because of sanctions and because of some of these technology constraints at a lower level with some constraints. Um, but Russia has also drawn upon uh, partnerships that it has to fill in some of the gaps, uh, most notably Iran and acquiring uh, UAVs uh, to be able to strike Ukrainian targets. And Russia continues to field a pretty substantial air force. Uh, its naval capabilities are, uh, remain pretty intact, if a little bit constrained right now, it, or rather more than a little bit in, in the Black Sea because of Ukrainian um, adaptability. So it is a mixed picture, and I think that we need to be mindful of the fact that uh, as Russia continues to suffer losses in Ukraine, it is also learning how to adapt. It is learning uh, both tactically, operationally, and somewhat strategically how to adapt, and it is drawing lessons learned itself. And we're seeing some of those play out in how Russia is conducting, for example, the operations right now uh, in Bakhmut in eastern Ukraine. Russia also has a, a deep bench um, of personnel uh, that it can draw upon, and we've seen it rely more on um, the human factor in war. So it's an it's a evolving picture, um, and we can be confident that we can learn the lessons and we can stay ahead of the curve, but we can't take it for granted. So that is what we are, are um, that is our posture towards understanding how Russia as an acute threat, but as a, as one of my colleagues uh, referred to it, Russia is an acute threat, but it's a chronic condition. And so we are not um, losing sight of the fact that even as Russia is uh, facing a strategic failure in Ukraine, it will remain a militarily capable adversary that we have to right-size our plans, our operations, and our capabilities to cope with. So does that mean that uh, the DOD is approaching it as though there's this window of opportunity that it can take to try and strengthen deterrence in Europe in the near term as Russia potentially focuses on reconstituting its forces in the future? Yes. Um, we already have adjusted. We, the United States surged uh, capabilities to Europe a year ago now as we come up, up upon the one year uh, of the beginning of this part of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, NATO did stand up, uh, expanded from four battle groups uh, on the eastern flank to eight battle groups and is resourcing those battle groups to have that combat credible power. And right now, uh, the NATO uh, military staff uh, is working on new plans and a new force model to meet the new s security environment, which is a more challenging one in terms of Russian, clearly Russian intent. Uh, and again, not taking for granted those Russian capabilities. And that will be the focus of the Vilnius summit of approving those new plans, those new force models, and identifying the new capabilities that uh, will be required for NATO, to ha NATO allies to have that credible combat power. Yeah, I was recently uh, at NATO where I heard about some of what they're doing with the force models, and it's quite fascinating, the idea of assigning different forces to geographies and various threats. So, you know, hopefully some more meat will be on the bones of that in the future. Um, I want to ask you about the long-term approach to the crisis in Ukraine. You know, I specifically want to ask about some of the U.S. and allied support to Ukrainian forces. And we've seen that this has grown over time. Mm -hmm. Capabilities that were once off the table uh, are now on the table, you know, such as tanks. Um, but we've also heard uh, additional requests for more capabilities. Just yesterday, um, Ukrainian President Zelensky was in London where he was talking about his request for fighter jets, and I know that there's been also requests for F-16s in particular, um, but we've also had other types of support growing as well. 
yesterday, the Washington Post uh, reported about some of the U.S. targeting support to Ukrainian forces, um, which I don't think was previously um, in open source. And so what is it that we should expect to see as next steps in terms of U.S. military support to Ukraine? And do you think that this level of support that we're seeing from the United States, from NATO partners, from other nations, can this be sustained over time uh, in light of some of the stress that it's placing on allies and partners, as well as some of the stress on the defense industrial base? So uh, the way I, I would characterize it uh, is that I would put it into two buckets. Um, there was the response to the immediate needs of Ukrainian armed forces <coughs> to be able to defend itself. And that actually evolved over the last year because the shape of the fight evolved. Initially, uh, the Ukrainians really needed the capabilities as urgently as possible to uh, fight the Russians against the Russian assault on Kyiv because that was the main objective a year ago, to, to, to take the capital city uh, to overthrow the Ukrainian government and take control of the country that way. So that was the, the point at which stingers, javelins, some of those immediate capabilities were most important. And then as the fight evolved, as the Ukrainians successfully defended uh, Kyiv and the Russians had to pull back and began to focus their forces on the eastern uh, side of Ukraine, it became really more of an artillery battle. And that's when we shifted to the capabilities, again, off the shelf that we could provide for the fight in the moment, focusing on uh, modern NATO standard artillery uh, and the HIMAR system and the ammunition for the HIMAR system. And now, as the fight is shifting, again, that's why we've looked at uh, the requirements that Ukraine has for armored vehicles to be able to, to complement uh, the artillery capabilities that we've built for them so that they could conduct that fight. So think of it as an evolution in the immediate fight. That's one bucket. And that is supported in the United States case primarily by uh, presidential drawdown authority because it's what, what do we have now that we can deliver now. Longer term, we rely upon the uh, USAI, the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, which is not something we take off the shelf or out of storage to um, provide to the Ukrainians, but actually precisely comes from defense procurement. So thinking longer term about Ukraine's air defense requirements, longer term modernization, getting off of its reliance on Soviet era armor ammunition, uh, the whole, you know, kit that it was able to use to good effect, but those, you know, it's, it's, Ukraine's got to move on to a modern military to have that credible combat power. So that's kind of the shift that, that we've moved to, um, and that's, we've also worked with industry, not just on making sure allies and partners have the capabilities they need, but that we are able to plan for that kind of capability for Ukraine, because when there is um, a either a, a negotiated settlement or Ukrainian success um, on its own in taking back its territory, there will be a change in the conditions. Hopefully, Russia will wake up to the fact that it cannot defeat Ukraine, uh, and there will be a, um, a drawdown in the, in the intensity of the fighting, and that will create an opportunity for Ukraine then to build a longer-term credible defense uh, capability, including air power, including uh, to complement what it's doing in ground, in ground capabilities and air defense capabilities. So, but that's longer term because it is through a procurement facility as opposed to the immediate um, value of drawdown. And we are planning for that. Um, it will require, first, of, first and foremost, congressional support because nothing happens without the financing. But we feel what we're hearing from members of Congress is there is an understanding that it's important to begin thinking longer term about Ukraine's defense capabilities. And there's a big training component as well. Uh, so we are thinking about that longer term, uh, even as we are helping Ukraine conduct the, the fighting that it's doing every day right now. And so looking at that longer term, you know, you and I were talking beforehand, and I think there's another contact group meeting that's coming up. And so is this going to be on the table for discussion uh, with the Secretary of Defense and some of his counterparts about, you know, what material support might look like? Yeah, the early days of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, the first uh, meeting was in April of last year, was really focused on the immediate fight. But over time, we have now 
expanded the discussion and the issues that ministers are briefed on, still focusing on the immediate fight, the urgent need to get our, our ammunition, to get capabilities into Ukraine, but also to look at issues like sustainment, like training in maintenance so that the Ukrainian armed forces themselves can maintain and keep uh, this new modern equipment that it is utilizing to good effect, ready for longer term defense. Uh, we are definitely looking at issues of the defense industrial base. How can we work together again both to resupply ourselves, to main sh make sure that we are um, properly resourced and that is a major uh, priority for all the ministers when we have these conversations, but also beginning to think about what our Ukraine's capabilities going forward going to look like and how might we collectively but also individually uh, provide those capabilities as appropriate from a national basis. So you mentioned before that there seem to be two different pathways moving forward for how this conflict ends. One could be on the battlefield and the other is negotiated settlement. Uh, is the DOD planning for both is in the conversations that you're having with NATO allies and partners, you know, to sort of paraphrase, uh, you know, back from the Iraq and Afghanistan days, tell me how this ends. Well, it ends in Russia's strategic failure, no question. Um, Russia has already been exposed as, uh, as a country that threatens its neighbors immediately, but threatens the global rules-based international order that so many countries, all countries, have a stake in. Um, members of the UN count on the UN Charter as an element of their security, and it's pretty clear that Russia uh, is not, uh, does not behave in ways that are consistent with its obligations, especially as a permanent member of the Security Council. Um, I, th I think that it is, it is difficult ahead of time to precisely predict how an armed conflict will end um, because there are many pathways, there are many battles, many days for Ukraine to continue to fight. Um, but we are confident uh, that Russia will not achieve its strategic or even its operational objectives. And we are confident that the Ukrainian armed forces is up to the task of defending its country. Whether that results in a moment in which the Ukrainian leadership is then confident that it can achieve uh, what it needs to provide for the security of its country at the negotiating table, or whether it needs to continue to fight, that is up to the Ukrainian leadership, supported by its um, public, and we, you know, we don't have a right to determine that for them. We are supporting them diplomatically. We are supporting them in the defense uh, realm in order to be able to create the space for Ukraine uh, to be ready for either of those uh, <coughs> pathways, which probably have many branch, branch branches side, and sequel. Yeah, right, right, many branches. <laughs> so the other revisionist actor that we hear quite a lot about aside from Russia is China. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, a lot of folks have been talking about a potential Taiwan contingency what the department has called its pacing scenario. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion amongst European allies and partners in particular about what they might be called upon to do in case of an Indo-Pacific contingency. You know, would they be required to sort of double down on deterrence in their own neighborhood to ensure that, you know, a resurgent Russia, uh, you know, can't aggress in any way, whether that's opportunistic aggression or otherwise, or will they be called upon to, you know, play a large role in such a, you know, potential contingency to possibly defend Taiwan? You know, moving forward, sort of, what is the theory of the case? Are, is the department looking for partners to European partners to focus on deterrence in Europe? Do both? What's sort of the mix? Mm. Well, I think the most important point is that the department is looking to allies and partners in Europe to do what is in their national security mm -hmm. interests. And now, many, uh, if not every, but a subs you know, the vast majority of European countries have identified China also as um, a challenge, a strategic challenge to European and global security um, that is now recognized in the NATO strategic concept and it is actually activated in um, the activities and, um, and policies of many European countries. 
We now have the AUKUS construct, the Australia, UK, US construct for looking at supporting an Asian ally, uh, an Asia Pacific uh, ally, Australia, with the support of not just the United States, um, but the UK. And there are other examples of European countries that uh, have military presence, um, are supporting freedom of navigation missions. So that is an individual national decision about how to best uh, activate that kind of uh, recognition of the strategic challenge that China poses. But in the European context in particular, probably the most important step that, me that European countries have taken nationally and under the NATO construct and actually also under the European Union is to make sure that they are resilient against Chinese coercion, mm -hmm. resilient against vulnerability that China might choose to exercise. And that level of awareness has really become heightened in, in the last couple of years. And the United States works with European allies and partners to give them our best experiences on how to create that resilience and remove those vulnerabilities in economy, in technology, and across the board. You started off uh, today by <laughs> talking a little bit about how large your portfolio is and the various threats uh, that you know the United States faces. So let's not forget about the Middle East and Africa. Um, you know, that being said, China is the pacing challenge, and that has been prioritized as the top challenge. And then you know behind that is Russia. Um, so there has been this element of risk acceptance within the national defense strategy in order to focus on those priority threats and risk accept acceptance against some threats like Iran and VEOs. So if we're looking to uh, the Middle East and Africa, it seems as though Washington is going to be accepting risk in those regions. Is this true? And if so, what does that look like? And what are some of the implications for our regional partners there? Sure. The, the national defense strategy um, does uh, require a focus on Indo-Pacific and on uh, the European theater. And so there is a pro has been a process of right-sizing our posture, um, particularly in the Middle East. But right-sizing the posture has been built upon working with uh, allies and partners in the region on their own capabilities, and in particular, the opportunities created by some of the political and relational um, evolution, particularly in the Middle East, uh, for better integration among our regional partners for providing for their own defense capabilities. There's enormous uh, advanced military capability in that region. The United States has worked with uh, our, our allies and partners in the region to enhance their national capabilities, and now we're working with many of them to see how they could better work with one another with our participation to address the, the, common, the common threats that they, they face and they recognize. So posture is not the only way that the United States can uh, uh, contribute to regional security. We work with partners we, uh, through whether that is security assistance, that is exercises, a whole host of activities. Um, and even though we've right-sized our posture in the Middle East, we've not left. Um, the United States remains active uh, and works every day with allies and partners to ensure that they uh, are confident that they have what they need and that we are there to support them. Well, thank you for um, the opportunity to make a shameless plug for uh, the next installment of the Mission Brief series, which is on Monday with the AFSENT commander. So folks are more than invited to join us for that one as well, where we're going to be talking about some of those uh, same topics, particularly regional integration, as well as posture and innovation. Um, so I think now, just because based on time, I could ask you questions all day, which you don't have. But I want to be mindful of our audience and our virtual audience. Uh, so let's shift to question and answers, if you're comfortable with Good. that. Um, let's start with in person. So uh, Dimitri, saw your hand up already. Um, just wait for the mic. And if you could identify yourself uh, when you ask a question, that would be fantastic. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Dimitri Sevastopoulos of the Financial Times. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, you know, China is the pacing threat. We've heard that many times. AUKUS is a landmark defense pact mm -hmm. with two Five Eyes allies. 
Taiwan needs weapons very badly, and the Ukraine war has shown that that's even more the case. Mm -hmm. But there seem to be really big obstacles, both in terms of getting weapons to Taiwan quickly, um, and then with AUKUS, there seems to still be lots of obstacles about tech transfer, both maybe less so for the submarines, but certainly for the advanced capabilities. Why is you know, the, the Biden administration struggling to overcome what are ultimately bureaucratic hurdles to meet what is the pacing challenge? And, and how can you overcome some of those things more quickly to do some of the things that, that you and Becky have just been talking about? Well, on the production side and providing capabilities um, to uh, partners in Indo-Pacific, specifically Taiwan, but others as well, uh, we have the Deputy Secretary, Sec Deputy Secretary Hicks, has led uh, a concerted uh, focus on identifying the some of the bottlenecks in defense industrial production, and. Uh, we are already seeing the effects in some areas, such as uh, ammunition production, the upward trajectory. Uh, but it is something that we've worked on over the last few months, and you're going to not see the effects of. You will begin to see the effects over time. And it won't be just incremental. It's breaking through some bottlenecks. So we are, are focused on that. And it is uh, it was a wake-up call. It was um, an unfortunate wake-up call, obviously, for the Ukrainian people. Uh, but it was uh, timely to understand uh, that we not only had those challenges, but what we've learned is we have really workable solutions, including Congress has helped us out by passing legislation that allows us to do multi-year procurement. And so there, there are a number of ways to address those challenges, and they are absolutely being worked on by a special focus working group led by the Deputy Secretary. Um, on technology, you know, again, there's good reasons for restrictions on technology transfer um, in, in principle and in the abstract. And then what you, when you look at specific opportunities for cooperation with allies and partners, you find that you may need to break through some of those or adjust some of those bureaucratic rules, which are there for a good reason, um, in order to achieve the objective. So that is inherent in international cooperation. It's not. Uh, that's surprising. It's something, again, we deal with in, in NATO all the time. Um, and this was a new venture. So those particular uh, obstacles were not, you know, they were laying there. They weren't recognized. Once they were recognized, uh, they were being addressed. And there is a terrific team at the White House uh, led by Dr. Jim Miller and um, a terrific team at DOD, Aid Denmark, leading it uh, to exactly work on those every day. And from what I can see of their schedules, they are working on it every day. So I'm confident that we will address those now that we know exactly what they are. And Taiwan arms to Taiwan also? Well, I can't speak to specifics on, you know, sort of partly for operational security reasons, partly because my brain is full of what we're providing Ukraine, and there's only so much room in my brain. Um, but uh, I, my colleague Eli, Ratney, uh, Eli Ratner, is, um, who's well known at CNS, I believe, uh, is uh, very focused on that. And he and I uh, spend a lot of time talking about lessons learned from Ukraine, and I know that is helping them wor work through um, how they can best supply Taiwan with the capabilities it requires for credible combat power. I'm now going to shift to a question from one of our virtual audience members that talks about the linkage between Europe and the Indo-Pacific. I had mentioned that I was just at NATO, and I heard a lot of the common refrain that what happens in Europe has implications for deterrence in the Indo-Pacific. So this question is from Tony. Do you attribute the recent agreement with the Philippine Secretary, uh, the Philippine SECDEF announcement uh, during his recent trip, really being a reflection? reflection of the successes in mobilizing NATO against Russia? Uh, I, I think a lot of countries, uh, include, and many in, in the Asia Pacific, have seen uh, that a credible uh, relationship among like-minded countries uh, can steadily provide effective deterrence. I, you know, I think it's a sort of unspoken, but let me speak it. Russia is being deterred every single day. N Russia takes seriously NATO capabilities, the credibility of Article 5, and that is something that is built over time. 
with a um, not least American presence, but also a clear political commitment between the United States and its allies in Europe. That exists, uh, exists and already existed in Asia, Asia Pacific as well, but we absolutely are seeing the seriousness with, with which many of China's neighbors are taking uh, how important it is to not just have a crisis response, but if you want to have effective deterrence, to have that kind of presence, that kind of very clear and apparent capability, and that political commitment of allies and partners, all of that adds up to credible deterrence. And I think that's why you're seeing some of the developments that we now see in the Asia Pacific. Well, that is music to my ears, my military analyst ears. Let's take another question from the audience. Uh, Max? Thanks so much, Max Bergman from CSIS. Um, you mentioned uh, the problem of the European defense industrial base not just being a problem for Europe, but being a problem for the entire NATO alliance. I'm curious uh, what sort of paths do you see to kind of rectify this? It seems to me that we have a bit of a problem where there's sort of a vicious cycle where American arms sales are, uh, Americans can pr American defense companies can produce weapon systems off the shelf, Koreans, uh, and that's where Europeans are turning. They're not turning to their own defense suppliers. So are, uh, as part of this kind of consideration about the need for Europe to also have a strong defense industrial base, are we reconsidering kind of our arms sales approach to Europe, which we had really emphasized? Uh, are we looking at ways of reciprocity to give European companies potentially more access to our defense market, which would be quite complicated? I'm curious just how do we kind of resurrect the European defense industrial base uh, besides Europe just needing to spend more? Is, is that the only sort of solution that you see? Well, we want European allies to buy the very best capabilities they can, and if that's American-made capabilities, that's fine. Um, so, but you're, you're right that Europe having a strong defense industrial base is in the interest of the United States and in the interest of the alliance. One of the challenges that we've, we've, lear we've learned or has become apparent is that um, some of the platforms um, that are very um, capable um, and that different countries in Europe have uh, provided to Ukraine use different, even though they use the same caliber, say, of artillery, it's still different variants of artillery. And so the production lines, there aren't synergies, there aren't sort of more, more than the sum of its parts uh, um, value in the uh, defense industrial base in Europe. And that's one of, the folk, uh, one of the focus issues that this National Armaments Directors Group under, the, under NATO, but also now lashed up with the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, is looking at. Are there ways to um, create uh, common standards for some of the more uh, sort of in-demand capabilities that uh, countries are going to need to provide to themselves as well as have you know a pretty good demand signal abroad for as example. Um, so I don't think there's a, a set solution to this and because each some of the countries in Europe are going to want to keep their individual capabilities. It's what they've trained on, it's what they've you know stocked their their own military capabilities with. Uh, but can we find ways to, looking forward, create more common standards or a common base? And I think we are very much uh, interested in doing that. And we, I, I think our experience so far is that U.S. industry, defense industry, is interested as well and is open to this. It's kind of an all-hands-on-deck moment for us because the requirements are substantial. And some of the old arguments about where it was sort of a zero-sum pot of you know ability of countries to procure the it's not really i mean i guess ultimately it's zero sum but it's growing given the commitment of nato allies to uh, spend two percent uh, as a floor uh, well in the u.s parlance as a as a floor um, so i think the opportunity is there but it's going to take a little bit of time to to work its way out but we do see examples already in the short term 
And I think those common standards would be really interesting when you look at some of the problems of interoperability. What that would actually enable is a higher standard, which is interchangeability, right? Having common platforms that could be used if needed across different uh, allies and partners. So let me take another question from uh, our virtual audience, which is on a region that we haven't touched on yet, which is Latin America, which mm -hmm. also falls under your portfolio. Actually, it, it doesn't. doesn't? Oh, but no. I'll do my best. But this is actually about Russia. OK. So in theory, it might. Uh, what is Russia doing in Latin America? And do we see uh, more coercive activities occurring there? Uh, you know, Russia has a select handful of countries with which it has managed to develop decent relations. Um, Russia remains, uh, Russian Navy, you know, periodically does port visits, does presence visits, probably not, uh, certainly not on the scale that say, the Soviet Union did during its height and its global reach. Um, but Russia is, uh, does have relationships with countries in uh, South and Central America that it uses to enhance its own presence, to challenge the United States and, and our interests in, uh, you know, kind of a freedom of navigation, uh, best practices. So it, I would say that Russia is something we take seriously but it is not something that is a growing challenge. It's sort of a persistent aspect of uh, Russia's efforts to prove that it is a global power and to seek sort of points of weakness uh, that it can, it can exploit. And the, and the challenge and the duty for the United States is to make sure that its access uh, actually doesn't lead to that kind of advantage. And I, I feel pretty confident that we're managing that successfully. Great. Uh, anyone else here? Uh, Joe? Thank you. Just wait for the mic if you wouldn't mind. Um, thanks so much. Uh, Joe Gould from Defense News. Um, last month at Ramstein, we heard uh, General Milley say that it would be very difficult for Ukraine to militarily eject uh, Russian forces from all of Ukraine. Um, you know, you talked about um, preventing Russia from meeting its strategic objectives. And I wanted to ask, does that mean uh, the US supporting Ukraine to retake Crimea? Or at least with the recent commitment of longer range, small diameter uh, bombs to strike Russian targets in, um, in uh, Crimea with US supplied weapons? Thanks. So the United States, be very clear, the United States supports Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty over its internationally recognized borders, and that includes Crimea. And Ukraine has the right to defend every inch of its territory, uh, and uh, insofar as Ukraine um, identifies uh, operational value in targeting Russian forces on Ukrainian territory, the United States has, you know, we, we don't have objections and, and do not seek to limit Ukrainian military operations to achieve their objectives. Um, you know, I'm not going to contradict General Milley. Um, and I think he was giving a hard headed assessment of the scale of the challenge uh, in front of the Ukrainians, but the Ukrainians have shown themselves quite adept at learning. Uh, quite committed to uh, their political objectives of achieving control over their territory. But what I want to do is come back to our opening point about integrated deterrence, but integrated foreign policy. Um, there, it is not just militarily on the battlefield that Ukraine is advancing that. It is advancing that goal diplomatically at the UN and with um, G7 support. Uh, we are doing all we can economically to continue to constrain the Russian economy, to limit Russian ability to fund its war effort. So it's not just militarily on the ground that, that, um, that Ukraine is able to advance the objective, but it is through an integrated diplomatic, economic, political, as well as defense and military strategy that we support them in. So in line with those efforts to have greater integration, Brian asks about how is it that we apply our experience from the crisis in Ukraine to make our non-crisis time responses more efficient? That will be a major element of uh, the new, I think, the new plans, for example, uh, NATO, 
uh, and the new force model, the um, recognition of the importance of rapid response, airlift, mobility, logistics. Um, I've spent more time in meetings on logistics and sustainment as Assistant Secretary of Defense than I ever thought possible, um, and really have come to have incredible, I, I'm in awe of the part of the U.S. military whose job it is to make sure that um, U.S. forces can be where they need to be uh, quickly and sustainably, and not just to conduct, uh, to conduct military um, operations, but for things like rapid response to the tragic uh, earthquake in Turkey and Syria. So we are absolutely learning all those lessons. We, can, we knew them already from other um, military missions that the U.S. has had. Uh, but adjusting those for the European context is something that is ongoing and I, I believe we'll have a good, uh, good answers by the time we get to the Vilnius summit. It is the deeply unsexy parts of uh, the military that actually tend to be the most important. Uh, so we have a little bit more time for a few more questions here in the audience. So let's go with Joe and then Amanda. Thanks, uh, John Moffat from the British Embassy. Um, we talked a lot about uh, how we manage integrated deterrence in Europe through, through NATO, which is this clear established structure. Um, but when we look across at the Indo-Pacific, there's a myriad of different alliances, structures, groupings, uh, which, which make managing integrated deterrence you know, clearly much harder in, the, in that environment. So I just wonder if you had any perspectives on, on what different approaches we might take in the future uh, on, in the Indo-Pacific to try and manage uh, integrated deterrence. And is there anything new that we would uh, take on board to signal to allies what, what's required? Well, the, the sort of quick and flip answer is that's Eli's problem, not mine. Um, <laughs> we like making problems for Eli here at CNAS. <laughs> um, but I, I think that you, know, you, have to, you have to go to integrated deterrence with the forces you have. Um, and so the fact that there's a different array of relationships and opportunities for creating credible, uh, credible combat power, credible deterrence in Asia doesn't mean it is you know, it, it has um, other strengths, which is there's more than one challenge in, a, in Asia Pacific. It's, you know, there's also North Korea um, as well as China. So I think that there are ways to view that actually as an advantage because it can address different challenges in the Indo-Pacific. I mean, NATO is a, a extraordinary achievement and a historically, at this point, unique achievement um, that doesn't mean that the United States can't work with allies and partners. And has, we, we worked with the allies and partners uh, to sustain the operations uh, in, in Afghanistan. That was some NATO allies, but it wasn't only a NATO construct. So we, are, we have experience of successful coalitions that are not rooted in a you know, sort of brick and mortar uh, alliance headquarters the way that we have uh, the advantage of NATO. So I'm, I, I don't see that that is a, uh, I think it's a different array, but it's not a weakness of our alliance network and partner network uh, elsewhere. So let's go to Amanda, and then I've got another good question from our virtual audience. Good morning. The 2024 isn't too far off. This summer we're going to hear the cadence of announcements. What I'm interested in is in your discussions with allies, have they asked about our elections at all and how that's going to shape our foreign policy or our support, or is that bridge bridged across when we get there? Um, I think allies and, and partners are tracking American domestic politics because they know as a democracy our foreign policy is determined by uh, what our society supports and, and who they elect. Uh, but no, they don't ask us about it largely because they know as national security leaders we don't, we don't get involved in domestic politics, we don't speak to domestic politics. So I think it is absolutely fair your, your observation that there is a recognition that you know, different leaders uh, bring different views of national security and foreign policy. Um, but I think allies and partners uh, are focused right now on working with this administration as the elected, uh, lead, the Biden, uh, that President Biden is the elected leader of the American people and focused on working with us now and establishing uh, the basis for an integrated deterrence and credible combat power, and that will be enduring. 
So question from uh, Zainab from Twitter, actually. Um, it's clear that the Islamic Republic of Iran is now an active actor in Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Is the U.S. working with its allies to counter Iranian malign activity? Yes. Uh, the United States is uh, working diplomatically with many countries to make them aware of uh, the challenge that the Russian-Iranian collaboration not only is an active threat against uh, Ukrainian citizens, but actually may enhance uh, Iran's malign activities by giving it capabilities, experience, support from Russia. This is something we are talking to countries in the Middle East um, that they need to pay attention to this and be concerned about this and work with us uh, to uh, counter where possible and certainly to take, uh, to take note of. Um, so the United States recognizes the challenge that Iran as a regional power poses and the threat it poses to its neighbors. And of course, the United States remains focused on uh, preventing Iran from achieving a nuclear weapons capability. This is layered on top of the activities now that um, are of concern, the Russian-Iranian um, collaboration in the defense industry uh, or in the, in the defense pro uh, procurement uh, realm, but it doesn't fundamentally change our assessment of the challenge. That's the various rack and stacks yeah. of the challenges. Uh, so we've got time for maybe one or two more questions uh, right there. from the Embassy of Finland. Um, you have referred a few times to the Minsk summit, of course, and the, all the work ongoing within NATO. But how would you describe at this stage uh, the outcome of Vilnius? What would you like to see um, as the message coming out of Vilnius? Well, the most important thing that we, we need to see and we will see is continued and even strengthened alliance unity. Um, not merely on the principled stand on Ukraine and its right to choose its own future and the right of its people to live a secure and prosperous life, even as neighbors of a, of a chronic condition of Russia, of Russia under Putin, um, but specifically underneath that, that or, or the broader context of that is unity about commitment to NATO's, um, the alliance itself to European security, uh, to the security of um, NATO allies, but Europe as, as a whole. Um, the more secure that NATO allies are, the more we reinforce uh, European security more broadly. So that's the most important message. Underneath that will be the how. How do we reinforce that? That will be the new capabilities, the new force model. That will be a renewed uh, commitment to appropriate defense spending to resource those capabilities. Um, and uh, hopefully it will be welcoming to new members of NATO. Okay, I think we have time maybe for one more question if we have one. Uh, Hannah? Hi, I'm Hannah, uh, research assistant at the Center for New American Security. You talked a little bit about classification issues and the good reasons for a lot of those restrictions, but to the extent that we do want to break down some of those barriers, what are the challenges to that, be it cultural or procedural or otherwise? I, I am not in it, uh, you know, sort of I've never worked in the intelligence community. I'm a, I'm a policy person, so I think, you know, I have a, um, I don't have that level of uh, professional, uh, uh, subject matter expertise, but as a consumer of intelligence, um, I would say that I think that it is, I, I personally believe in erring on the side of caution. Um, I, I believe that one of the reasons why um, the DOD, State Department, National Security Council, all of us who work on the policy side are able to effectively protect Americans every day is because of the extraordinary work that our intelligence uh, services ac across the board um, do. We could not do our jobs. We could not keep America safe. Um, we could not protect our national security interests if it weren't for uh, our intelligence services. They, it's, uh, it, we, and everything we do depends on that. Um, 
so I want to just be clear on that. I think I, I wouldn't criticize the overclassification, but it is a, it is a big project to make sure that incoming political appointees like uh, like myself understand the reasons for different levels of classification. We go through that training, we understand it, and I think that us being refreshed on why those different categories exist, what they protect, uh, the reasons for them, helps us then understand when there is a requirement to put something in a different category. So I, I think we have the ability to do this. I think we do it every day. I wouldn't make too much of this publicly because I think that there's an awareness of the challenge and it is being worked on in a concrete way. But again, I just want to make the statement that I really think that this all per that Americans need to understand that this is in their interest because this enables us to do our jobs and make sure that we appropriately protect uh, this country and our political system that makes it a vibrant, wonderful country to be a part of. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation, and I said wide-ranging at the start, but it really went very wide-ranging in directions that I didn't even expect. Um, so before we close out, could you just really quickly recap what today's mission brief is and why it's important? Well, thank you. I think the, the questions from you, from all of our participants, really did highlight um, how the United States has enormous capabilities. Uh, but in order to be able to do our job of protecting the American people, but also contributing to global security, we rely upon an extraordinary network of allies and partners. So if nothing else from this mission brief today, if your takeaway is that integrated deterrence is about all the means of national power, all of our national capabilities, but also about our network of allies and partners um, around the world, uh, then I think that we've had a successful mission brief. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you to our audience for joining us as well, and to our virtual audience. And hopefully you will all join us for our next mission brief event, which is on Monday, because when it rains, it pours, uh, which is with the AFSENT commander. So until next time, folks, which is Monday. <laughs> <laughs>